Pulled up to the scene in a 65 Bentley, dripped in Brioni, China doll with me, looking like a supermodel, oh what a feeling, 25 years old, 25 million, today's the audition for the Godfather part, my life's already a movie so when do I start, I walk up in Patsy's East 119th Street, Fat Tony Salerno gets a kiss on the cheek, I know my way around, not my first time here, been doing overnight cigarette loans for 10 years, I say hello to Danny Pagano and Tough Tony, Nicky Domino gives me a nod, they all know me, they ask why I'm there so early, I say the part, they say what part? I say the movie, why not? I don't look like Carlo, they all begin laughing 3 p.m. ready for the lights My name is Gianni Russo A.K.A. Carlo The infamous son-in-law from The Godfather I'm now known as the Hollywood Godfather And this is my story Walking with a limp like will I ever run? Once again or is this it? Am I forever done? Living in the hospital was never fun some people were cool, but not everyone. You never know. Welcome, everybody. It's time for another Hollywood Godfather podcast. And I have my compadre and co writer, Pat Piccarelli, with me today again, as usual. And we have an amazing guest today, which Pat will tell us about. Hey, every- hey everybody. Hope everybody's doing well. Uh, yeah, as Johnny said, we have a guest and we've been doing this show uh, we're in our fifth year and we have never had a guest like what you're going to hear for the next two episodes this is going to be uh an episode that'll drop twice once next week and once the following week before we introduce him i'm going to uh read a quote from him and then we will get on with the show we don't belong to nobody and everybody belongs to us if you've got it, we want a piece. This was the motto of the Ghost Shadows, Chinatown's most feared criminal gang. And for almost a quarter of a century, it was the creed of which I lived my life. What was mine was mine, and what was yours was mine too. I did what I wanted, took what I liked, and smashed everyone who got in my way. Whether you were a rival Chinese American gangster, a Dominican drug dealer, or a made guy in one of New York City's infamous five mafia families, it didn't make a damn bit of difference to me or my crew. Understand this, all gangsters are violent, but the ghost shadows took violence to a different level. Close quote. At that, and without further delay, we introduce to our audience, Kenny Wong. Hey, Kenny. Hi, thanks for having me on. Oh, we've been looking forward to this. Uh, Kenny, we have a lot of mutual friends. I I read your proposal. Peter and uh, Gambino, all those guys. uh, By the way, we we also want to thank Michael Moy, who set this up. Uh, Michael Moy was a guest of ours a few weeks ago. He uh, is the uh, uh, spokesperson for Chinatown Gang Stories. It's a YouTube channel. If you haven't checked it out already, please do. It's fascinating. Okay, Kenny. Uh, I, I mean, you know, I, I grew up in the same neighborhood you did, of course, uh, with different families, different lifestyles, et cetera. But what I read here and what I learned about your life is so fascinating. You know, when we opened up the show, I said to our viewers, you're not going to hear anything like what Kenny has to say in any of our previous shows. And we've done over 200 of them. So start uh, well, you were you were a die low in, in in the ghost shadows, correct? Uh, mm, I wouldn't say. I would say I would be in the middle management. Okay, what would that what would that compare to uh, uh, a m- mafia crew? Is that like a captain? A capo. Uh, yeah, I have the status of it, but I don't have the title. Yeah. Okay. Uh, right. th- my boss is the head of the gang, and I. And so only to him and nobody else. Okay. So how old were you when you got involved? Um, first, I was uh, just uh, affiliated, uh, hanging around with the, uh, the younger crew. Uh, started probably like around 14 years old. And then when I was uh, 17, uh, it became a full-time uh, gig. I... Uh, um, Started hanging around with uh, uh, the crew in Chinatown, 
uh, the main crew, uh, the Bay Arch Street Ghost Shadow. And uh, once I'm down there, uh, um, the boss, the, the, the leader of, uh, of the gang uh, already uh, took a liking to me and um, uh, had me by, him si- by his side and uh, took me under his wings. And, and that's when I really started in, uh, when I was 17. Well, you joined well, while you were involved. You had a specific goal. Uh, and that was to avenge your father's death. Yeah. Well, I wouldn't say avenge in a way, but I was very, uh, when my father passed away, I was only 10 years old. And um, I guess it traumatized me to the point where I felt a lot of hatred. Well, he didn't die of normal uh, circumstances, though, as as I interpreted it. Um, what do you mean? Um, he didn't die like, just a natural death. Oh, he got gunned down. He got gunned yeah, when down. You're, well, when you say the most my father passed away, most people think, you know, he had an illness. I just want to clarify that. Yeah, somebody put a hit out on him and uh, took care of business. And uh, it uh, really traumatized me. Uh, and it got me, my personality changed to a very hatred uh, little, young little kid. And the way... Uh, oh, the, the, Kenny. Yeah. Tell us, a, tell us a little bit about your father because you were a little bit disillusioned a, as a kid. You had no idea to the extent he was involved in things perhaps he shouldn't have been involved in. So, give us the background as you knew it. Uh, okay, my father was uh, a businessman um, in Chinatown. Uh, he does uh, import, export, uh, dry goods for restaurants, and you know all sorts of uh, other stuff. He started off as a, a, a electrician. Um, and then he jumped into uh, uh, other businesses uh, like uh, import export, and he also have a lot of dealings with, uh, with uh, uh, gambling. You know, all Chinese love gambling, and uh, my father was one of those guys that um, is very uh, compulsive and, and and addictive to uh, gambling. And he started uh, running his own games, underground uh, gambling uh, joints. And for him as a businessman with no connections, he know he knew a lot of people, a lot of people knew him, uh, but as a businessman only. Um, so he had to get in contact with uh, a certain group, a group of people or a gang um, to protection, for protection or, 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 or so uh, it won't get robbed, the, the place won't get robbed and the customers will feel safe uh, going in and out and playing uh, at his joint. So he got in contact uh, with um, um, the then uh, Mott Street Ghost Shadows, uh, the, the highest leader, uh, the, uh, Peter Chen, kids, right? So they became partners in the, in the gambling joint that they had in uh, Baxter Street, uh, across the street from the tombs. Yeah. What did he do wrong to get himself a, a, a target of a hit? What did he do wrong? A, f- a few things. Um, number one, he didn't belong to any tongs. Okay, uh, explain explain to our, our listeners who don't know what a tongue is. A tongue is supposedly uh, a community um, merchants association, you know, do good for the community. Uh, where whereas if new immigrants come over, um, um, they have uh, no means of. Uh, of getting a job uh, outside of Chinatown and they will help them if they start up a business in, in Chinatown, uh, they will ask for advice and you know how to go about uh, starting the business in, in, uh, within uh, Chinatown. In uh, reality? In reality, they're just like a, a mafia organization, you know? but they don't do their own dirty, uh, their own dirty work. Um, people that does it are the higher hands like us. We're the street kids and we're the ones that uh, that does it, there are uh, 30 deeds when, when it needs to, when time uh, calls for it. Okay, so this was the uh, An Liang and the Hip Sing, the, 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 the two main tongs. Yes, yes. Okay, so you were saying, uh, you know, your father was gambling and uh, how did he get on the wrong side? Which which tong was it, first of all? He has good relation with both tongs. Okay. But the main thing that 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 really troubles me is that I have I don't understand why if you're dealing with uh, these type of a uh, borderline underground uh, business type of dealings, um, you should have 
uh, become uh, either all a uh, uh, hip sing or on your tongue member. So you get protection. If you're a member of them, it's like, you know, uh, um, if, it, if somebody needs to put a hit out on you or, or, or disrupt your business or, or pushing up on you or extorting you, you're under the protection of the association that you are a member of. And if there is a hit that needs to uh, be sanctioned, the heads of the association at times uh, need to be uh, confided. And, and if it's okay to go, go about it, you know. Okay. It, what did your father do that pissed them off? So all the pieces and bits of uh, information that I gathered all these years uh, from investigating, asking around, and um, and my research. Uh, so he had an import export uh, company um, that in Chinatown, a warehouse with uh, freezers, fridge, and all that stuff for you know dry goods. Um, so he had a, he made a deal with this other guy that was a uh, Singh. Uh, uh, a member, um, which had dry goods of uh, shark fin. Uh, shark fin is a very uh, expensive uh, 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 delicacy. Yeah, yeah, delicacy that uh, a lot of uh, Chinese restaurants have it during weddings and big. Uh, oh and, yeah, uh, the shark shark fin okay. soup and all that stuff. I mean, that's great. And also dry abalone, the really big ones uh, from uh, South Africa or, or down south uh, South America. They're, they're a lot of money too. They, uh, and that's a very uh, um, expensive uh, item for uh, a delicacy for restaurants uh, to have during you know banquets or whatever. So he set the, him up and uh, also ha- ha- with, uh, with the ghost shadow. Um, so they parted up to rob this guy out of his, uh, his goods. And also I think it, it was 50 or $100,000 uh, cash involved. Um, and they robbed him. So the the, the ghost shadows uh, did the ro- robbery uh, like uh, like it was uh they while they were dealing it at the warehouse, the ghost shadows barged uh, kicked in the door and robbed both sides, both sides of uh, the deal, uh, to make it look like it's uh, nobody was you know it was just uh, a random uh, robbery. So the ghost shadows uh, ran off with the go- uh, the goods and. Um, a um, few days later, um, they were everybody was uh, speculating. News went out. Um, um, who did the the robbery? Who who, who would do it? Um, nobody knew until my father. But during the robbery, the the gold shadow member also took his watch, uh, his uh, his pinky ring, and some gold chains uh, that he was uh, wearing during that time. But the funny thing is that the arrogance of my father was that um, three days later. Um, walking around Chinatown, um, he had his uh, watch with him. He had his uh, gold ring and his gold chain. Mm-hmm. And that made people, you know, um, went to figure, well, how the hell did you get it? Uh, get it back? You know, everybody, you know, lost all their stuff, uh, lost money, lost the goods. Um, we got cleaned out. How the hell did you get it? So you must have been, either you know the people that did it uh, or you're part of it. You set the shit, the whole shit up, you know? So that, I believe that's how he got killed uh, uh, because of that incident. And how old were you at that time? I was probably eight, nine years old. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Um, oh, I didn't know about it until um, later on in the years uh, when I grew up a little bit more. So once you're involved in, in the, the gang, do you want to get the person who killed your father? This is understandable. And it seems, you know, from from what uh, I was reading about you and what Michael told me and a few other people, you were driven to find this guy throughout your entire career with the gang. Is that true? It was hate. I mean, my father was like, like God to me. Idolized my father. Uh, he was very proud of me, and and I I let's put put it this way: I worship my father like he was a god. Yeah. And when somebody took that away from me, uh, I just lost it. Um, well, and up until that time, I mean, you were a a, a, a typical American, a Chinese American kid. I mean, you you were a Boy Scout. You did everything that was supposed to be done correctly. You were doing it. Tell us about that part of your life. 
around the neighborhood of where I live in the in the Gravesend, Shipset Bay. On that block, I was the, we were the only Asian family. Um, we had some Italians and uh, Irish kids and uh, uh, Jewish kids. I played wolf football. I ride with them all around the block. We go play uh, our Space Invaders every day. Now, um, we hang out together. Uh, we go to school together. I mean, I was just a typical American kid, you know, uh, growing up in Brooklyn neighborhood. You, know? oh, you didn't speak Chinese to any extent either, did you? Well, now I have an accent because I went back to Hong Kong uh, when I was uh, 15 years old. Why? Uh, um, I was cutting out of school, um, not coming home, uh, uh, hanging around with friends. And then eventually uh, word got out, it got, got back to my family um, that I was starting to hang out in Chinatown. And, and that's a no-no. Um, okay, so this change in attitude was because of the effect your father's death had on you. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. Okay, well, so well, you, you anybody, I think. I mean, you know. But still now your family wants to get you away from these bad influences. So how do you wind up in Hong Kong? With who did you go? Or did you just say set you off? During that time, I was the only grandson. Um from the oldest son. So uh, I carry the family name. And uh, being the only grandson, uh, only uh, from, from uh, that lineage, they want to preserve and protect at all costs. So they thought that if uh, they uh, uh, bring me back to Hong Kong and uh, learn a little bit Chinese, um, how to be a little bit more subtle, uh, learn the traditional ways of, um, of a normal Chinese kid, I will, I will probably you know, uh, discipline myself, learn some discipline. Okay, in reality, when In reality, there, Hong Kong is bad. You got, you got mixed up with the triads, correct? That's a breeding ground for triads. And how, how did that happen? And when, what happened? I was going to school um, in, in, um, in this, um, uh, they call North Point. Um, I was that's being. Not, by, or, or uh, I was 15 years old. I was 15 years no, old. That, that's, that's in Hong Kong or Kowloon? Yeah, in Hong Kong. In Hong Kong. Yeah. Okay, right. Yeah, on the Hong Kong Island side. So for me as a, a American uh, uh, kid going back to Hong Kong, that uh, my, my Chinese, uh, my Cantonese were very, very, very poor. Um, they made fun of me all the time. Um, pick on me, you know, I probably because of uh, the cultural difference. Uh, I grew up in America, they're in Hong Kong. The way I dressed was uh, different than them. Um, so I was the target of uh, being bullied. And, and for me, not um, always um, have that attitude that I, I, I'm not going to be picked on. I, I stand for myself. So um, got into a lot of fights with them and eventually uh, got into a lot of trouble with school. Uh, even though I was a you know, foreign uh, exchange kid, um, one of my classmates told me, if the, you want them to get off your back, you have to join a uh, triad. If you're a member um, and they know that you're a member, they'll leave you alone. You, know, you have protection. So I said, why not? You know, why not? Mm -hmm. Let's do it. So I joined the rival gang, a rival triad uh, from the guys that was picking on me. Um, and, and it worked. You know, I had peace throughout uh, during that time. But uh, so uh, about how old were you at, at this point? It, it it was the first couple of months when I was back there. It was yeah, you know, beginning of uh, probably um, right after uh, I will say fifteen and a half years old. You know, not okay, even. So you you're you're in the triad, and you 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 feel a sense of peace, but you feel also a sense of uh, camaraderie. You got people on your side. You're with. So, something that gives you purpose. Yes. And how did that progress to the next step while you were in the triad? Well, there was an ongoing uh, turf war uh, going on uh, with uh, uh, for construction, for construction site, uh, which triad will control the, the operations of that con uh, construction site. Uh, that's big money for, for the organization. It's basically uh, extortion of the construction site, right? 
Well, yes. Who t- who takes over that construction site to operate it and uh, put people in there, uh, the materials, whatever, anything, you know. Um, it's lucrative. Yeah. So they would they use machete back uh, back in Hong Kong um, as uh, when they face off. Um, when the negotiations uh, fail, uh, both sides start chopping uh, chopping each other up, you know, with the uh, machetes. Um, and the and the gangs with uh, most people standing wins, you know, uh, until one side says, "Oh, let's give up. I don't want. I don't want to put. Uh, you know, uh, uh, keep on paying for the hospital bills or, or or bail money or whatever." So during that time, I was uh, I was a young kid, a young kid that followed uh, one of the uh, the crew leader, and the crew leader, when when all said and done, after after everybody was down on the floor, he just told me, "Yo, grab the knife." You have your knife on you, go there and slice him up. I said, while he's on the floor? I said, yeah. You have to smell the blood. And once you smell the blood, the next time you'll be able to do it uh, without anybody telling you. You, you, you want to do it. Um, and you did it. Yeah, I did it. How did it make you feel first time? I don't know. It was uh, The feeling was nervous, scared, or excitement. Um, well, let me, ask, let me ask you this. How did you feel the second time? Second time was easy. Yeah, that's what I figured. <laughs> yeah. Like a freaking vampire, you know, uh, <laughs> taste of blood and then everything else uh, falls, uh, falls in place. You know, you want it again. Yeah. So uh, aside from defending your, your, your triad, what, what were you doing? What kind of crimes? What else did you get involved in? Um, I mean, you're only 15 years old here. You know? I didn't really have too much activities. Mostly uh, um, it was sent to do... Uh, Odd jobs like beating people up, um, uh, follow uh, one of the older guys uh, while he's on collection to uh, to face off as muscle, you know. Yeah, I, I was just too young. I was scrawny. I, I wasn't really that big. Uh, 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 I mean, I was bigger than most of the uh, Chinese kids in Hong Kong of my age. Um, maybe it's because of uh, the, the milk that I drink in America. You know, <laughs> <laughs> the protein that, that we have over here. Swinging a, a, a machete though makes you a little bigger and more powerful. I mean, it's a little bit different. It, you don't just hold a machete; they tie it up or they wrap it up with uh, either duct tape or or, or a uh, cloth, so it doesn't fall off. Uh, uh, fall um, out of your hand when you're yeah. chopping somebody, when you're slicing somebody, and and it's also um, uh, a different color code where they where they recognize their own people uh, during the uh, the scuffle. You know. What was color coded? The blades. Oh, the, not the blade. The wrapping. Oh, okay. The, when you're holding the blade, and they wrap it around your 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 right. like, hand, that, so that identifies you. So you don't drop it. Yeah. Who were you living with at the time? Um, my grandmother, my my mother's side, grandma, uh, grandma. Yeah. Do you have any idea what was going on? Not really. Not really. Uh, until later on, uh, they started. Uh, you know, thinking that I'm acting funny, I'm always uh, on the phone with somebody. Uh, I'm always uh, um, I come home late from after school. Uh, weekends I'm not around. Um, so they started, you know, to ask questions, but I I kept it, uh, you know, a uh, secret for a while, for a while until until I think a week before I came back to America. Why did you come back? I mean, what was how long were you there? First of all, I was there probably like around. A little bit over a year, right before I was uh, seventeen, I came back. Why did you? How did you come back? Under what circumstances? Um, I was crying. I, I called back to America to my uh, my aunt, my uh, one of my uh, father's uh, uh, younger sisters, and being the only grandson, I kept on crying and 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 um, told her I wanted to come back. You know, they they're picking on me over here. You know, I'm being bullied. I'm your I'm your only nephew. You have to protect me. That's your duty. <laughs> It oh, worked. Yeah, it worked. You know, a lot of luring. And, and while, uh, Kenny, while you're coming back to America, uh, we, we're going to have to go to a commercial. Okay. All right, please. All right. We'll be right back. Remember, we know where you are, so don't go anywhere. We are pleased to announce the publication of a new book series from Gianni Russo and Patrick Piccarelli entitled The Sixth Family. When the alleged daughter of Marilyn Monroe asks for help, Gianni Russo becomes entangled in a web of lies and violence in the search for the late actress's diary. 
Soon, he is enmeshed in a mystery that involves a presidential candidate, a disgruntled Mafia Copo, a retired NYPD detective, and the past of Mafia boss Frank Costello. Russo must race against the clock to stop a hostile reorganization of the American Mafia while trying to stay one step ahead of a faceless killer. While listening to this book, skillfully read by Gianni himself, the listener will have to determine what is true and what is fiction. Or as Gianni says before this epic story begins, this book is a work of fiction, except for the parts that are true. Look out for the second installment of this exciting new series coming in 2023. The Sixth Family. Book One is available now on Amazon.com. We're back. Okay, so uh, when, when we left, uh, you have arrived back in in, uh, in Chinatown. Did you seek out the ghost shadows? Did you? And, no, you had a taste of the life now. Mm -hmm. And was this what you wanted to do? To be honest, I was never a really violent person until you know, the, my father passed away. You know, it changed me, my whole uh, personality. It brought up the devil in me uh, for some reason. I, it took me a long time to fix myself uh, mentally to get to where I'm at right now. Um, yeah, I was very determined. Once I got back, I said, I said to myself, I think I'm ready. I got, I got the proper training. Um, I think I got the balls to do whatever, whatever it takes. Uh, to oh, so your, your father's cousin was Benny Ong, and I know who he, who he is or was. Tell everybody who Benny Ong was. You talking about the godfather of Chinatown? Yes. No, yeah. he wasn't a cousin. Uh, my grandmother is, uh, has the same la last name. They're from the same village. Okay. Uh, who, Hundreds of years, uh, years of bloodline, they they are considered uh, uncle and a niece. Yeah. One uh, um, one level higher than, uh, status, one level higher than my uh, my grandmother. So my father is like a a, a grand nephew to uh, to Benny Ong. Okay, so when, when well, explain who, who he was. Uh, Benny Ong is the. AKA Uncle Seven. Um, he was the, I would say, the forever president or uh, 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 spokesperson for uh, the Hip Sing Asso Association. Uh, it's uh, it's located on Pell Street. It's uh, that association dates back probably like um, at the beginning of uh, of uh, Chinatown when they first built it back in the. Uh, eight, uh, early 1800s or whatever, you know, I, I, I'm not sure about the history. Um, but he's a very powerful figure. Okay. I met so, him several times. Everybody did who lived down there. I used to see well, him. I know out. what I'm saying, yeah. The, yeah. He's very, he, he walked the streets like God. Forget it. Yeah. Did everybody you, did, respected him. Did you, did you seek him out? Did you want to go into the lifestyle and, and he was your conduit to get into the lifestyle? No, because I... I had a feeling, and with all the you know the the adults were talking about the, my father's uh, passing and why it happened and how uh, how all that thing uh, you know they were speculating. I caught on to bits and pieces of it, and I always figured that it had something to do with the uh, hip singing and 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 the flying dragons. So I really hate, grew up growing up hating uh, hating a uh, hip singing and only uh, uh, and and uh, flying dragons. So that was never a uh, there was. I, I would never join that part, a part of the uh, Chinatown. So how did, how, how did you get involved with the Ghost Shadows? Um, my father used to uh, work with the uh, kids, I, Peter Chen, uh, with the gambling houses. So we're, they have really good relationships uh, uh, at like a brotherhood. Um, we're always down on Mott Street. And, and a lot of times my father on the weekend um, after dinner would um, Use me as an excuse and take me out to Chinatown at night uh, and tell my mom, hey, uh, I'm going to bring uh, uh, Kenny with me. I'm going to go play MJ uh, with the guys. In natural reality, he went down there to the gambling houses. Uh, he would uh, hang out with the, the, the ghost shadow, uh, uh, the hierarchies, and they would leave me with, uh, with one of the soldiers or, or uh, 
the girls to uh, look after. Um, you probably know one of them. Um, you probably heard of him. His name is uh, Bradley Joe, BJ. Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, you yeah. know what, what, what I also learned? I mean, I, I was a kid and I really didn't know what I was learning. But after I, I became older, I, I realized that the elders, uh, Peter Chins, Benny Ongs, uh, Johnny Yang, if you know Johnny Yang, uh, they discouraged younger people from getting involved in the life. Seriously, they, they do. They do. Oh. Uh, like I said, when I was, uh, before I went back to Hong Kong, uh, 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 before the age of 15, um, a lot of times, uh, while before Peter Chin was locked up in 84, I will always run down to Chinatown, China Fair, and hang out with uh, a lot of his uh, younger uh, uh, guys. Uh, and once he spotted me, he will, you know, grab me, uh, tell one of his uh, guys, yo, take him back to uh, Brooklyn, make sure he's in school. Uh, if he comes down here, you ought to answer. That's your responsibility from now on. So I made it tough for a lot of um, uh, a lot of uh, the go shadows, our uh, older member that that was placing responsibility to tell, look after me and make sure that I'm not down in Chinatown. Um, yeah. They understand that that's not, not the life for anybody to live. Um, so that's very that interesting because, you know, when I was younger, at the same age as you're talking, I'm a lot older than you, but uh, like, you know, Carlo Gambino and O'Neill and those guys that were one block away from you, they, they protected me. They didn't want me involved. I never did get involved because if that that's what it should be out of respect to your family. And that's, I, I knew that from them, uh, you know, just being around the Hongs that that's, they, they didn't encourage it. They had other people to do that. Not people that were basically indirectly their family members, which they considered you'd be a family member, obviously. So you, you wind up taking their advice or their direction or their orders. You wind up going back to Brooklyn. Well, I was forced. Uh, they they grabbed me and you know put me in their car and drove back to Brooklyn. <laughs> oh. Yeah, but w when you get there, you, you wind up putting together your own crew. Um, that was after '84. Uh, after uh, Peter Chin and uh, the twenty five uh, Go Shadow members that uh, got indicted, they got locked up. Um, I and I, I kind of like you know I, I want to start my own crew in Brooklyn. Um, to carry on the name, the ghost shadow's not dead yet. You know, uh, we're still around, and you know, I think we should do our part. So that's why I formed a couple of guys, and we, you know, um, that have uh, ties with uh, other uh, ghost shadow members also, and and we formed together. It was actually uh, guys that were that I went to school with in Ships at Bay. Okay, but you didn't go anywhere near Chinatown. Not during that time. We just operate around, roam around uh, Brooklyn. Brooklyn. What, you, what were you doing with this crew? What kind of crimes? Um, exploding, exploding Chinese restaurants. Mm -hmm. um, we're very low level back then. We're just kids. We didn't really even know the, the trick of the trade yet. Uh, um, all we know is that look, we, we run out of money. Let's go uh, um, extort the Chinese restaurants. Tell them that they're under our protection from now on. Uh, they're for grabs anyway. It's uh, it's uh, the outer uh, perimeters of Chinatown. So Nobody should, should be able to, nobody has a, has a claim on it yet. You know? So the more you got involved, uh, did you start uh, thinking, well, I'm getting all these uh, all these connections. You, you had your taste of violence back in Hong Kong. You set your sights on, on finding the person who, who killed your dad. I mean, that was that was your goal. Yes. You had that, that fire inside <laughs> of you and nothing was going to change it. No, it wasn't going to change. But, and also, I, making a lot of m money didn't really uh, uh, present itself until you got a taste of it. And then you surely grasped it. I mean, you were going to Atlantic City and the other places you were going through a lot of money. That was later on in the years. That was when I was like 18 years old. That's when I started making money. Doing what? I was, uh, like I said, I was under the... Uh, um, the guidance of the, um, the leader of the our gang, Go Shadow, during that time, uh, uh, my, my era, Robin, Robin T. Yeah. So I was considered his, uh, in the beginning, I would say I, I was his errand boy. Um, and he was 
guiding me, teaching me, lecturing me to how to become uh, useful for him. Um, so slowly but surely, I was taking care of some of his stuff. At first, I was just buying him cigarettes, picking up uh, his uh, his uh, takeout order, you know, dry cleaning, this and that, you know. And then uh, eventually it escalated to uh, uh, picking up drug money. I didn't know it was drug money. He just told me, yeah, hey, listen, go to that location. Um, uh, at a certain time, there's a duffel bag. Um, he knows who you are. He already uh, recognized you. He, he, he's seen you before. So just go there at that time and just pick up that bag and bring it back down to China to me. So when did you start getting seriously involved in heavy duty crime? When I started understanding that all that money came from uh, some heroin. Uh, from, that's uh, the big heroin, money. De- yeah, heroin uh, dealings. Um, and I was part of the game. I was a uh, I was one of the deliverers that delivered uh, the, the goods. Uh, I was the warehouse keeper. Um, I was the one that go grab the big shipment and bring it back. Um, what, what, what kind of weight are we talking about here? We're talking about a brick is uh, 700 grams. That's, the, that's how it comes when, in, in, from the um, Golden Triangle. Okay. Uh, 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 probably like what a uh, pound and a half or something like that right yeah. and uh the price of it that we pay for probably like around 60 65 um and it it's so pure that you could chop it up uh you could cut it into like one brick could, could, can make like around six seven bricks to be honest um well so you're talking close to half a million dollars and, um for one one brick and you could yeah. probably sell that uh, break for like around close to a hundred, mm. and if uh, you sell it to uh, uh, the Spanish or, or whoever that's uh, that street level, you could probably bring it up to a uh, hundred thirty uh, per break. So, how, how old are you at this time? I'm fifty three. No, at this no, I, I mean at the oh, time. Eighteen. Eighteen. Okay, so now you're making a lot of money, and you discover Atlantic City. Uh, t- tell us. I mean, I was reading about this, this uh, what you were doing down there, the, m- the money you were going through. Uh, tell us a little bit about that. I'm not really a gambler. Um, I go down there to eat, uh, buy stuff, spend money, whatever you know. Uh, but I don't gamble. Um, I'm not a heavy gambler. I, I was too young, I didn't even understand uh, yeah. uh, the, how, how the games were played. Um, when I first went down to Atlanta City, the first time it was Robin that took me down there my boss um, and I see the way he plays and um, um, and obviously all uh, street guys got a habit. I used to do coke, you know, um, without him knowing, but I carry his stuff for him. He, he used to do a lot of uh, um, um, coke too. So I was the one that holds uh, the goods for him. Whenever he needs it, I would give it to him, you know, and then I got hooked on myself. I wouldn't say hooked on during that time, uh, but uh, curiosity, I, I would be playing with them, um, with my friends, uh, snort a couple of lines, drink, um, party with the girls in Atlanta City. Uh, but uh, I wasn't much of a big spender until later on in the years. Um, that's when I discovered that how to uh, play the games, how to gamble. You know. I mean, what, 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 kind of, what kind of money were you going through? I will say if I ever lost money, it wasn't it wasn't an elected city. It, it was it was uh, football betting uh, with the uh, with the uh, bookies in uh, New York. I would bet on every single freaking game um, for for that Sunday. Uh, I don't know much about um, college fo- uh, both football, but NFL. I would I would bet on every damn game. There's- uh, Sunday and Monday, yeah, those three days. And if I'm lucky, I might make out something, but most of the time I lose. What what kind of money are we talking about? We're talking about two, three thousand for uh, for a game. Uh, mm-hmm. Sometimes I will put uh, a couple of games together in the box, uh, do a couple of reverses, you know, and yeah. you know how, how, how much that money goes, you know. Um, in the beginning, I still had money. I was able to pay up uh, every week um, uh, to support that game we have. And then it escalated. Who was your bookmaker at that time? Do you remember? 
Yeah, nine fingers, they call him. Okay. This guy, nine fingers. He was a Chinese bookie. I'm an easy guy. But who was he turning into? I have no idea. I didn't care. Oh. As long as I bet with you, if I win, you better you better pay up. Yeah. yeah. So it went, it got so bad that I owed this freaking guy like close to 300. Uh 300 grand. Wow. It, I think it was like around two and a half weeks of uh betting uh, that I that I kept on telling you, yeah, push it over, push it over to next week. And he actually sent some boys down uh to collect on my street. Um, which that that was a mistake by him. Uh, I smacked the shit out of both of them. And I told uh, both of them, I said, yo, uh, tell your boss, give me a call. You know what? Matter of fact, just tell him he's not going to get paid because he disrespected me on my street. You should have gave me a, a page, uh, try some means of uh, uh, contact me and, and, and we'll talk about it. But no, you have to send somebody here to disrespect me and, and um, make me look stupid. So I said, you're not getting paid. Right? So said, what became of that? You just wanted to pay the guy or not? He can't do nothing. Yeah. What can he do? Yeah, that's you really know who I am. Uh, uh, I mean, I'm not a a very powerful person. I'm a well known uh, gangster, but he knows who I am uh, enough to know that uh, I'm not the person to fuck with. You know. Don't and so he just let it go. He let it go. Well, uh, uh, apparently yeah. you had more juice than you thought you had because that's a lot of money. <laughs> well, at that well, age, no, but see the bottom line though they they're not going to get killed. He'll take them out. Yeah. They, they're, they're used to shaking down idiots that'll go and get the money if they could fear them. That's the only way he got paid. These guys got paid if they if they feared you, and you didn't fear. He didn't fear them. So where's, where are they going to run? It, it was more like I'm extorting them in a way, right? Instead of you know uh, uh, regular uh, business uh, dealings, you know, it was kind of dirty, dirty tactics uh, on my side. So as your career, if you can call it that, escalated, what did it escalate into what were you what were you doing uh, aside from the drugs and i mean that there were robberies i'm sure you know we discussed that i was taking care of a lot of uh uh business for uh for my boss uh, that was passed down uh from uh, alia like there was an incident in um uh cleveland cleveland ohio um one of the gambling houses uh, that was uh, being operated in Cleveland, Ohio, under the banner of uh, Aliang Association, mm. was being uh, there was some uh, problems there. There was a guy that 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 started uh, that started trouble. Um, there was a guy that that played there, lost all his money, and uh, at that the last bet, he pulled out a thirty-eight revolver and placed it on a on a bet. I'm betting this, right? And you better fucking pay if I win. So. It caused a really uh, big incident in small community, a uh, Chinese community, and um, uh, the office over there, the the Aliang uh, Merchants uh, office over there, called over for help. And because um, Chinese people, you know, it's all about face and respect. You disrespect. So let me people. let me ask you a question. Acting as my audience would, in Cleveland, that also was a Chinese organization, not Italian. No, it was a Chinese. It was it was a, there was an Aliang association there. Okay, that's yeah. why I'm the no, no, that's what I'm talking about. So they asked for help and they sent us over there, and uh, we went over there and took care of business. Uh, we, I didn't take him out. We just I just broke him, uh, broke his hand, um, broke his hand with uh, with a hammer, uh, messed him up really bad. Um, I even took his gun. I said, "Oh, nice piece." Uh, I took it with me. I never bought it back. I, I left it in Cleveland, but. Um, uh, we just messed them up. We just show well, them a lesson. Them. That's all. <laughs> uh, don't mess with this place. This is not a place where you should you should uh, start trouble with. You, know. you you were pretty well known by the fifth precinct, as I recall. Uh, they never bothered you, well, except to this time you hadn't been arrested. I don't think I ever. I, I've been arrested a couple of times, but they. But I mean, they, time. You did no time. They let me out. Yeah. They didn't put me through central booking and all that stuff. Um, I guess they didn't want the trouble. They were on the payroll. <laughs> well, I wouldn't say they were on the payroll. They, it, it wasn't serious enough for them to do that type of paperwork. And and you know what? Uh, just give me a warning. Uh, uh, don't start any trouble. 
Yeah. You don't give us trouble. We don't. We, we don't start nothing. Yeah. We won't bother you. A, a, any serious problems with the other gangs of uh, uh, Chin or a, any of them uh, that you, you you really had to go to battle with? Uh, the Tongans. Okay. Uh, I hated them. Um, there was an incident that I uh, talked to uh, Miles about. You know, uh, my sister was, uh, my younger sister had a friend. Um, she didn't know. My, my sister was very innocent, you know. She's just a schoolgirl. Um, which her, that, that friend of hers, that girlfriend of hers were, was dating a Tonga member. And she, after school, they cut out of school or whatever, uh, took my sister down to Chinatown and started hanging around uh, uh, at the Tonga uh, clubhouse. Um, I found out. My mother found out. Uh, kept on paging me and uh, and uh, told me, uh, "Yo, get your sister back." Because uh, the Tongan uh, gang had a very uh, poor reputation reputation back then of uh, uh, doing the train the girls. Yeah. And and as a uh, older brother, I love my ki- uh, my 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 sisters. Uh, I I always feel that it was my duty to protect him with my life, whatever happens. Uh, so, excuse me for one minute. Uh, so what happened is that I uh, had a big uh, thing with them, uh, with the uh, gang leader, Sonny, uh, with uh, the gang, uh, Tonon Yang, and eventually uh, it escalated to a lot of people going to uh, the hospital and shootings. Okay, but... Uh... The rest of your gang career... Uh escalated, uh, put it that way. Um, you were involved with the Italians, uh, other ethnic groups, the level of violence increased. You were armed to the teeth. You were always running around with several weapons. What we're going to do now is uh, cut it here for the first episode because you have still a lot more to talk about. Yes. We'll continue this uh, with uh, episode number two. So, uh, Johnny, you want to bring us out here sure well this will we'll be back as you just heard, heard from pat with our a good friend kenny i'm calling a good friend already <laughs> uh, i'm afraid of him now but anyway <laughs> don't be, don't be. <laughs> no i'm only teasing you but uh we, we'll be back next week with this and i'm sure where he's going to take us next week is going to be way beyond what you just heard oh yeah We'll it gets be worse or better, depending on how you look at it. Yeah. Okay, Johnny, right. have a good night. Uh, Kenny, thank you very much for being thank with you. us. Thank you. And we'll be back next week. Listen, it was an honor. <laughs> thank uh, you. Ours, mine, please. Ours. Thank uh, you. Okay. Till next week. And that was that. And I'll be back. Thank you for tuning in to the Hollywood Godfather podcast. You can contact Gianni Russo or Patrick Picciarelli with your questions and comments through the contact section of our website, hollywoodgodfatherpodcast.com, which is where you can also subscribe to our weekly newsletter. You can also call and leave us a message at 646-776-3038. Remember to follow us on Instagram at Hollywood Godfather and on Facebook, as well as leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. We'd like to know what you like about what we're doing, what you'd like to hear in the future, and anything else you might suggest to improve our podcast. Most importantly, hit the subscribe button. We'll be back next week with stories of the mob and Hollywood, as well as answers to your messages. Good night. My kids still can't believe I sat with a saint. My life's like scenes out of a movie. I'm the Hollywood Godfather, truly. I got stories with them all. You know, celebrities, world leaders, icons. Who knows what's next for me? I'll never get too old to have a little fun. Come on, I'm Gianni Russo. A genuine one of a kind. What a ride it's been, this life of mine. And I ain't done yet. I'll be back until next time. And that was that. When I was seventeen. 
It was a very good year. It was a very good year for small town girls and soft summer nights. We'd hide from the light on the village green when I was seventeen. 